Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be looking at remote viewing from the inside out. Back by popular demand is my good friend Russell Targ, who will be celebrating his 88th birthday this year. Russell was the co-founder of the remote viewing program at SRI International in Menlo Park, California. With his partner, Hal Putoff, he co-authored the book Mind Reach. Scientists look at psychic abilities. It was a landmark book that put remote viewing on the map. Subsequently, Russell has written many other books, including most recently, The Reality of ESP, a physicist's proof of psychic abilities. Also, Limitless Mind, a guide to remote viewing and transformation of consciousness. Russell lives in Palo Alto, California, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Russell. It's a pleasure once again to be with you today. Well, I'm happy to be with you. Happy Valentine's Day. And I again appreciate the opportunity to talk about my favorite subject, finish up the work we did at Stanford Research Institute, and move on to something beyond that. As I recall in our last conversation, we spent a lot of time talking about your knowledge of remote viewing and your experience as what is called traditionally the monitor in remote viewing experiments. But you've also had experience as a percipient or a subject, as a remote viewer yourself. I know it goes back probably even to your childhood, but I'm very interested uh, to begin to talk about an experience you had uh, when you were at SRI working with Pat Price, and he wasn't able to show up. So you suddenly, without any warning, were asked to stand in for him and be the subject in a remote viewing trial. You know, that, that's right, Jeffrey. I, I would not have gone into remote viewing and psychic stuff as a profession if I had not had convincing psychic experiences as a child, so that I knew that when I was bailing out of my very successful laser program, I would have something to go into that would probably work. So when I started the program, the Stargate program at SRI, uh, I was pretty confident that we would be able to do something psychic and something successful. Now the incident you're talking about is that uh, we had done a number of successful remote viewings with Pat Price. The last one we did, Price described a weapons factory in Soviet Siberia, which was highly successful, where he just talked about a big crane and uh, spheres underground, and everyone was very excited. And there was a turning point in the program. The CIA had invited or coerced Price to leave the program and go live in Virginia. Hal was going on his vacation for the first time to take a break from the program. And I was doing a last remote viewing series with the great psychic Pat Price. And what I was involved with is sitting with Price in our little shielded room and each day for five days, he was going to describe where Hal Putoff was somewhere in South America. This typical remote viewing. Here we are, Russ Targ and Pat Price. Um, Pat, what do you see? And one day he would see, I see a volcano. Another day he would see a harbor. Another day he would see a market. On day four, he might see a church. And on day five, he didn't show up. So I'm sitting in my little wire cage, Russ Targ and Pat Price doing a remote viewing, and I 
plaintively said in the tape recorder, and it looks like Pat's not going to show up, so I'll have to do it myself. Because I knew this was a serious, a, a, a serious group of experiments who really wanted to know whether Pat or somebody else would be able to describe what Hal was doing and where he was 2,000 miles away in Colombia, South America. Had you ever, at this point, participated in a formal remote viewing trial? I had not. They specifically didn't want the researchers to be involved in the experiments because it looks bad. We, you, we don't want to mix the, the psychics with the scientists. But this is a case where there was nobody else to do it, and I knew that we wanted to continue the series. So I just said, um, this is a remote viewing with Russ Targ and Pat Price. It's some date or other in 1974, probably June of 1974, because we knew that Price was going to leave shortly. And I said, Price is not here, so I will do it myself. I'll close my eyes and describe what I see. So I'm sitting in this little wire cage and close my eyes. And what I'm looking at appeared to be an island airport. So the, that was the Gestalt. I said on the, on the right side is some grass and sand. And on the left side looks like an airport building. And what do you know? It looks at the end of the airport like there's the ocean. So I'm looking at this airport with ocean at the end of the runway, sand and grass on the right, airport building on the left, pretty complete scene. And I said, I'll draw that. And it came to pass that Hal returned from Columbia, and he on that day had been given an invitation to fly out to an island airport uh, called San Andreas Island, and I now have pictures of the island, and I have pictures of the airport, and it turned out that the drawing that I made was really a first-class remote viewing, and the the payoff, the thing, the reason we're still talking about it, is it shows that remote viewing is so easy that even a scientist can do it. Well, as you describe your the way it all came up to you, it sounds as if you're you're already interpreting what you saw right away. It's an airport rather than just the raw sensory impressions. That's right. I didn't behave in the way a remote viewer is supposed to be. I would say to a viewer, what are you experiencing that makes you think it's an airport? And in this case, I would say, because it looks exactly like an airport. I see I see a runway, I see an airport building on the left, and the runway runs into the ocean. That's what I see, so that's what I'm going to draw. And it turned out that my drawing greatly corresponds to what was really there. And the, our management didn't like the fact that I was participating in an experiment because the psychics and the scientists were not supposed to mix but on the other hand, people recognize that it was an outstanding drawing. So I am happy that I overstepped the bounds in this particular instance. In effect, what you did is broke two of the so-called standard rules of separating the scientists from the psychics and also uh, of coming up right off the bat with an interpretation of, of your impressions, which suggests to me that Breaking the rules is sometimes the right thing to do. That's right. In experiments we did with Joe McMonigle, his very first remote viewing, when we chose him from one of six Army recruits, uh, he covered a page with little drawings, one of which was a quite good-looking architectural drawing of the Stanford Art Museum, three-dimensional drawing. And I said, you've got a lot of drawings here on the page. Could you choose one and make it clearer so that a poor judge won't have to look at nine or ten drawings to help the judge? Which one of these do you like? 
And of course, he liked the art museum and made a splendid three-dimensional drawing of that. And judges had no trouble choosing that. And we had no trouble choosing Joe to be part of the Army program. Joe McMonagall himself has often said, you know, don't be afraid of what is sometimes disparagingly called analytical overlay. Sometimes what you think is an analytical overlay is an accurate uh, depiction of the target. That's right. And that requires experience to separate what Ingo calls separate the psychic signal from the mental noise. You have to watch out for memory and imagination. That if you're, if you're sitting and doing a remote viewing and the first thing that comes to mind is an orange Volkswagen, we would say, okay, debrief that, put down orange Volkswagen at the top of the page, call it analytical overlay, and let's see what else shows up. We would never say, oh, cross that out, don't, don't pay attention to that. But if, so, if something that analytical shows up, we would just set it we would, we would honor the experience, set it aside, and go on and see what else is there. Now, in your case, uh, in this particular trial, your very first formal remote viewing trial, it, did you prep in any way for it? Did you just close your eyes and report the mental imagery? Did you, what else might you have done? Well, I'm a pretty good visualizer. So that when when I close my eyes, if I'm meditating, it's dark. If I am invited to, if somebody calls me up, as once once happened, I'd given a lecture at a dinner party, and the next day the hostess called me up and said, uh, "I've lost my tennis bracelet. My husband's going to kill me. Can you help me find it?" And I said, "Well, I don't know what a tennis bracelet is." And she said, well, it's a slim bracelet I wear on my wrist and it's covered with diamonds all the way around. Can, can, you find, can you find where it might be? So I just swiveled my chair from the screen where I was doing spreadsheets for costs, just turned my chair around to look at the map of the world, which is my other wall. And I said, well, I see two white four by fours a few feet apart. Do you have two posts set in your lawn somewhere? And she said, well, well, by the back door, there are those two four by fours with pointy tops. I said, well, go, go look at those and see if there's a bracelet there. And she came back a few minutes later, breathless and say, that's wonderful. I'm so happy. She didn't say, uh, how can I help you? What can I do to say thanks? She just said, Th thank you for finding my $50,000 bracelet. Everything will be peaceful in my home. But uh, that that that's typically the, or, or my daughter would want me to find her notebook or, or things like that. I, I'm pretty good at just closing my eyes and visualizing the thing that I'm looking for, which will come up whole as an image pretty clearly. I haven't done that for the uh, SRI program, but I certainly have done it in my life. People have the idea that I'm able to find things. So it's not uncommon for somebody, especially in the family. My, my, my daughter had lost, had written a term paper and she couldn't find it. So I was able to visualize that and tell her that she had put it in her dresser drawer. Well, before you did the your very first formal trial at SRI, had you engaged as a percipient of remote viewing informally? Not remote viewing. I had, I had a lot of experiences like that. When I first left graduate school, left Columbia, I got a job at Sperry Gyroscope Company uh, working on high-power microwave tubes. I was working for a very nice man, Morris Ettenberg, who's a PhD physicist, a flute player, and he taught Talmud at the Theological Seminary, 
Jewish Theological Seminary. So he was really a man for all seasons. And I always I didn't know anything about microwaves when he hired me. I always had the idea that he hired me just to keep him company on the drive from Great Neck, Long Island to the Upper West Side in New York. Because we would always chat about physics, religion, politics, whatever. He was very interested in whatever was going on. So we had, we had a nice opportunity, nice quiet time. I don't drive, of course, because of my bad vision. But we would chat. And uh, he knew about my interest in psychic stuff. So one day driving home, we're driving to the west from Long Island, the sun in my eyes. I had this hypnagogic image of what looked like a photostat, white printing on black background, except it was in Hebrew, and I don't speak Hebrew, I don't read Hebrew. So I told Morris, I'm looking at, I see an image here, it's very interesting. And I, I was aware, I knew that he wouldn't think I was crazy because he was aware of my interest in this. So I said, this looks like a, a flattened out scroll it's on a table, there's a tablecloth there, it's an oval table, and I see two candles, one at each end, and what's odd is the, all, all around this document, there are red circles and green leaves, it's very peculiar, with a pretty clear, complete image. Does that make any sense to you, Morris? He said, well, in Brooklyn, I have a rabbi friend, Schreiber, and he is often called to comment or correct uh, Hebrew documents that come over from Israel. So this might be something that he's working on because he is a table, round table, oval table with candles. I'll, I'll call him tonight and see if he has anything like that. So the next day, we, we go to work. And Morris said, I think I found your document. I, I drove to Brooklyn, and Schreiber had something a lot like what you're talking about. So that evening, I was invited over to Morris's house on the Upper West Side, not far from where I live. And what he had was this rolled-up document that he unrolled. In fact, it was a photostat of a Hebrew document. And, of course, it did not have leaves and flowers but Schreiber had put green check marks next to the things that he thought were red, were correct, and he put red circles around the things that he were thought were wrong. So in my little flash of something unasked for, uh, I got the red, red flower, the green checks, and the photostat of the Hebrew, and the setup with the candles and the oval table, all unasked for. Now, so the question is, where, where did that come from? Uh, at, at, Morris immediately recognized that this was his friend's house, and it was in Hebrew, so I don't read Hebrew. So Morris must have been a, a connection, or I wouldn't have even had the image. On the other hand, he didn't know anything about it at all. So he, but he was able to verify it for us. So it looks like it's some kind of precognitive event, but it was very clear, and it was clear enough so that I was willing to describe it to my boss at the risk of ha not having to think I'm crazy, but he was able to verify it the next day. And I, even as I describe it now, I feel shocked that I could describe a, a written document uh, so readily together with all the other circumstances. So that would have been 1954. I was 22 years old, uh, just out of, out of graduate school. It was my first job. So I, I, I know, now, let's see, 54, I was out of just college. This is a bit of 1956, and I was 22. So that would have been my first uh, high quality um, precognition or remote viewing kind of thing. Just about 20 years before you began your work as a parapsychology researcher. That's right. 
but I had uh, I had been do, involved with the Theosophical Society uh, for many years before that. I was a Kundalini meditator, reading uh, Avalon's book, The Serpent Power, trying to clear, clear my mind to live in loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity to the four immeasurables that the Buddhists believe in, but also that was part of the Kundalini. You want to learn to be a compassionate person. And to the dividend, you awaken your crown chakra to experience the cosmos. So in Kundalini, you re you release the energy in your spine, supposedly, goes up your spine and reaches your brain and awakens you to be able to uh, see the universe. And I, I was familiar with that. In fact, uh, I had an experience with our friend Charlie Tart, uh, psychologist, parapsychology. We were together and uh, sitting around the fireplace and I was sitting cross-legged meditating as he was, and I had this Kundalini experience. I could feel the energy, and that's a nice feeling. The reason that people do Kundalini is not to blow their brains out, but to have the f feeling of the of energy from the Kundalini meditation. But I felt this like a maybe stimulated by the fireplace, but I felt like a fire was going up my back, up my spine. And uh, that seemed very, I, I was aware that people say this is a dangerous thing to do without a teacher, as many things like this are. So I just stood up and started to wave my arms and terminate that experience. But I was far enough into Kundalini, so I understood the the process and the, and the hazards. Because I knew about Gropi Krishna, for example, who became a pretty well-known Hindu meditator and expert in kundalini after having a very bad experience that hospitalized him and he wrote a book about the the dangers of kundalini without a teacher so we i presume you've stopped the kundalini practice after that that's right i know i i didn't i i'm still a meditator but i'm i'm not doing the kundalini i don't especially now i'm an old man i don't have any brain cells to spare so I think the Kundalini is way too dangerous for me. I'm just a ordinary Hatha Yoga Shamatha meditator. Well, I used to practice Kundalini Yoga as part of the 3HO program initiated by Yogi Bhajan. Also, you probably know this big book that I have. Well, the Arthur Avalon is sort of from a different lineage, but yes, of course, that's a wonderful book. It's the Serpent Power, 500 pages of instruction on how to blow out your brains. Well, let me ask you this. How does the Kundalini meditation, as you recall it, differ from just regular meditation? Well, Kundalini meditation is quite... In in, in regular meditation, you're trying to be quiet and empty your visual field. In Kundalini, you have in mind to raise the serpent power. The, this is the meditation where you're actually doing something. In normal Hatha Yoga or Shabbatha meditation, you're trying to be quiet. The Kundalini meditation of Yogi Bhajan focused on a technique he called the breath of fire, which is very uh, short and rapid breaths uh, that involve the diaphragm quite a bit. I'm assuming that you were practicing something other than that. That's right. I, I was trying to do it. A a this is Avalon's book written in the early 1900s and reprinted numerous times. So I was trying to um, operate from, from his, his things. The interesting thing to me here, Russell, is that 
prior to you ever engaging in formal research as a parapsychologist, you had had uh, this spontaneous, I'll call it a spontaneous remote viewing or clairvoyant experience. You had been engaged with the Theosophical Society. You were practicing uh, Kundalini meditation and other forms of meditation. I think that all of those things are great preparation for somebody going into parapsychology in, in spite of the notion that uh, somehow the scientists must be objective and not participate subjectively in these sorts of activities. Yeah, I, w I would say that that's true. That is a, sir, it made me feel like... Um, in parapsychology research, have the opportunity to go into um, psychokinesis, which is enthusiastically followed by people. But the data, the effect size for psychokinesis is about 1% of the effect size for uh, visualizing things, telepathy and clairvoyance. So if I was going to bet my career on something, it was not going to be psychokinesis but rather it would be uh, perceptual effects. Now, I had an interesting uh, ex concatenation of experiences. When I was still working with lasers, I was interested in starting an ESP program somewhere. And I had an opportunity once to go to the CIA with and met Kit Green and tell him about my interest in doing that. That would have been in the in early uh, 1972. And through a strange collection of events, I got a chance to pitch my idea to Werner von Braun and the administrator of NASA. And that if you're interested in coincidences, this is one of the remarkable groups of coincidences that I experienced. So, so I'm interested in starting a program, but uh, a friend of mine was teaching at Esalen, this is Gene Millay, who you probably know. Gene had built a brainwave synchronizer, or um, Tim Scully built a synchronizer for her. So the two people, could be connected each to their own brainwave machines, detectors, and then the two machines were connected together. So the people lying adjacent to one another could get feedback when their two brain, when their two alpha were synchronized and in phase. It was a very unusual thing to want to do. And I had done that with Gene. And the effect is very strong. That is, when you have actually brought the two signals in phase, you feel a very strong connection with that person. Not sexual necessarily, but just a feeling of oneness and non-separation. Like, like there's a physical oneness. So there's a very, very powerful, surprising effect. And, and she had her brainwave synchronizer at Esalen, Institute and Big Sur, and she invited me to come with her, and I could show off my ESP teaching machine, the four choice biofeedback device that helps you become aware when you're doing something psychic. So that was my first first trip to Esla in April on uh, 1972, April 1972, before the SRI program. So. Jean was doing her thing. I was talking about American and Soviet research in parapsychology and demonstrating my ESP game, Four Choice Trial. And I met Mike Murphy, who was the owner and factotum at Esalen. He ran the thing, he owned the property, and he was the inspiring feeling behind Esalen. And I had not been there before, I didn't know Mike. But we all had a very nice weekend. And the following Monday, I got a call from Mike Murphy. He said, I'm sick of the dog. I've got a lecture 
to give at Grace Cathedral tomorrow night on Soviet work. I've been in Russia, but I liked your talk on Soviet American research. Could you go to Grace Cathedral and just give your talk for me? So I thought, Mike's a nice fellow. I've never been to Grace Cathedral. I could do that, no problem. So on Tuesday, I went to Grace Cathedral, big packed house, a big church sanctuary. I'm standing up by the altar and I give my talk. People seemed very happy with what I was talking about, interested. And at the end of my talk, a um, businessman walks up to me and says, that was a very interesting talk. My name is Art Reitz. I am the new project administrator that is the administrator of new projects at NASA. And I'm having a conference on speculative technology first week in May. Would you like to come to St. Simon's Island and tell a hundred or so scientists who are interested in new physics, new ideas, tell them what you're doing with ESP. And I said, sure, I could do that. We send me a ticket. And he said, I can, I can do that. We'd be happy to have you come. So this was a total strange occurrence. I didn't know Ed Reese. I didn't know anything about the conference. He didn't know anything about my lecture. He was just he at a NASA conference. He was walking down the street in front of Great Grace Cathedral and saw that somebody was lecturing on Soviet American ESP research. And he had an hour to kill, so he just walked in to see me. Total coincidence. So I went to the conference and I of course brought my little ESP teaching machine with me because I'm interested in starting, I'm still interested in starting a program. And who should I meet but Werner Von Braun, father of American rockets. And I chatted with him. And like so many high level people, he's not going to admit that he's psychic, but everybody is a psychic grandmother. So Von Braun told me about his grandmother who always knew when something strange was going to happen, usually something bad. And he did super well with my ESP game. When you get a hit, that is when you press the button corresponding to what the machine will choose on that instance, it'll ring a bell. So Von Brown kept ringing the bell, ringing the bell, drew, drew a crowd. And I told him, I'm interested in using this gadget to help astronauts become psychic so they can become aware of problems on their spacecraft. Now, if that sounds crazy to you, I recognize that, was the idea, uh, Isaac Asimov had a very intuitive semanticist, Selvar Hardin, who had recipes for a uh, acute life, and one of those is, Nothing has to be true. A thing just has to sound true. And the other is, you should never, a lie that you don't believe can never succeed. And he had a, a whole group of those things. So I, I could tell Von Braun, I'm interested in helping astronauts psychically become in touch with their spacecraft. And if I believed that, for some reason, he would believe that. And that's what happened. So he took me at this big crowd to meet uh, James Fletcher, who is the big boss, the administrator of NASA. And Von Braun said, Targ here has built lasers for us at Redstone Arsenal. I, I know what he does. And he now has this ESP gadget and he wants to teach people what it feels like they're psychic. He wants $80,000 from NASA to do a program. And Fletcher said, well, if he's got a place to do that, we might be able to help him. Now, it just happened, as we say, before I went to um, St. Simon's Island, Hal Putoff, who is a physicist at S SRI, graduate from Stanford, was giving a lecture at Stanford on Soviet and American research in parapsychology. 
So I had to go and hear him to find out what the competition is doing. And it turned out he's also a laser guy. He had written a book on nonlinear optics and was doing laser stuff at SRI, not ESP at all, but he's very interested in psychic stuff. So I said to Hal, well, I'm going to this NASA conference next week. If I can get some money, would you support my joining SRI to create a program? And he said, that sounds like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Because at SRI, if you have a reasonable program and money, it's like a farmer's market. You can bring your wagon in and do your thing if you've got money to do it. So I told uh, Jim Fletcher, I believe that I can do this at SRI. And at that moment, as we're standing talking, uh, Edgar Mitchell comes walking by, and he had just come back uh, from a venture in space, walking on the moon, doing an ESP experiment, and he was he overheard what we were talking about, and he said, well, I might be able to help you. I'm working with Willis Harmon at SRI on a new project and starting my new institute. Institute of Noetic Sciences, uh, I could get you, I could introduce you at SRI. So with my new friend, Art Reitz, who's the program manager, and Edgar Mitchell, we were able to go to Charlie Anderson at SRI, president of SRI. So we had a meeting with Edgar Mitchell, Art Reitz, Hal Putoff, and the president of SRI, where I said, I'm about to get $80,000 from SRI. Will you accept it and PS hire me to do a program? So with this, we had this concatenation of a dozen unrelated things that led to Charlie Anderson saying, yes, you can do the program at SRI. And that's how, and that was, those were the entire steps necessary in order to start the Stargate program at SRI. If Mitchell hadn't been there, if Art Reitz hadn't stumbled into my lecture, etc., there would have been no program because there would have been no money. So that made me become very interested in the whole idea of coincidences. And as you know, uh, Carl Jung was very interested Wolfgang Pauli were very interested, and the two of them wrote a book called The Interpretation of Nature and the Psyche by Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli. And of course, um, Carl Jung is a great psychiatrist, and Pauli is a Nobel Prize winning physicist. And what, what Pauli believed eventually is what, is what he called well, he is Nobel Prize for the exclusion principle, but from working with Carl Jung, he developed what he calls statistical causality, which is, says that things occur in a kind of a causal way. And Pauli knew that he had a bad reputation. I don't know if you know that. Pauli was a great physicist in Germany, but whenever he would come to town to visit somebody, their experiment would fail. So he was a non-experimentally conducive person. You could be doing an experiment and suddenly the whole thing would fail and screw up. Somebody would say, must be pa Pauli must be coming to see us. So he was aware that something about his thought processes or his being somehow in interfered with the causality of ordinary physics, and that greatly interested him. And he wasn't alone with not only Pauli, but David Bohm talked about quantum interconnectedness, the extent to which the things in the universe are connected to one another. And Einstein was worried about spooky connection at a distance being a manifestation of non-local physics in addition to non-local consciousness. So 
So there are a lot of Nobel Prize winning scientists, physicists, who are aware that there's something the matter with our causality. Now, a physicist believes that if you don't understand causality, you don't understand anything. But it interests me that you have this whole group of very famous physicists, all of whom were worried about the nature of causality, that things occur with that are not very probable. I once had well, I once had an occurrence like that, where I have a radio on my desk here, and I just sometimes listen to classical music from the local music station at a university. And I I was listening to music one day when I called a friend of mine who was a physicist in Philadelphia who was sick. He was actually dying of cancer, and I frequently chatted with him. We had a good time talking to one another. And he said, what are you listening to? And I said, I think they're playing a piano redaction of the Beethoven Fifth Symphony. Now, most people don't even know what that would be. That's that's the case where somebody has taken Beethoven's symphony and rewritten it for the piano. And I knew what that was because I was had musical friends. And he said, I can't believe that that's what you're listening to because I'm sitting here at the piano and I'm beginning to practice stuff that I played in college. And on the piano here is a piano redaction of the Beethoven Fifth Symphony, which I'm playing at the time you called me. What do you think of that? You have some interesting cases here. In Pauli's case, equipment breaks down around him. But in your case, it seems as if things come together, like the whole uh, parapsychology research program at SRI, which uh, had an enormous, I would even call it, revolutionary influence on our culture. I think that's true. And as I, as I wrote down the, the group of things, it was a, it's an amazing collection of unrelated. But if Mike Murphy hadn't gotten sick, I wouldn't have gone to Grace Cathedral. If Art Reitz didn't happen to walk down the street past that church, we wouldn't have gotten the conference. Probably if Werner von Braun didn't get super good scores with my ESP game, he wouldn't have taken me to Jim Fletcher. So it was like a dozen different things had to happen, all most of them quite improbable, in order for that program. It's as though that program was foredestined it was like like the universe was continuing to give us a push to make that program get started people often ask me well you guys had a very easy time everybody everybody gives you money you publish your papers in nature and the proceedings of the ieee you got a couple of million dollars a year how did you do that and the answer is we have no idea but we were we're, we're real. Hal and I were known physicists. We, we had both had career, successful career in laser physics, so we could at least get in the door. And then we worked with Pat Price, who was a highly psychic guy who, who knew what he was doing and uh, was successful. And the, so the CIA liked us. Well, you use the, the term predestination. I wonder what you think about that. Uh, I know you've done a lot of work in the whole f- area of precognition. I don't think you doubt that precognition is successful, but it certainly does imply that the future already exists somewhere. That's right. Pa- uh, Pauli was interested in a cause in a causality and synchronicity because he had precognitive dreams. Now I've had some very striking precognitive dreams. In fact, my precognitive dreams are probably the most striking of psychic thing that happened in my life. As I'm sitting here looking at the television, uh, one dream that the sort of TV oriented that I've told you about in the past, where I had a dream that I, 
about Esalen Institute. I had not been to Esalen for a decade. I gave my last, in fact, I'd been lecturing at Esalen for 40 years, and I sort of decided um, a decade ago that I, I'm, I am tired of giving the same lecture. I'm, teachers have that problem. So I said goodbye to Esalen about a decade ago, and then I had a dream 10 years later, which is basically last year, that I, there was a, a meeting in the big house at the round table where all my friends get together. And I had walked down to the bridge over the creek and I couldn't go to the lecture because they didn't have enough money. They wouldn't let me into Esalen. Now, this is somewhat of an anxiety dream, which anxiety dream, which would mark it off as not precognitive. But it was so realistic, and I certainly have no dreams. I was not dreaming about Esalen, and it was quite realistic. So it passed the bar. See, I don't, I don't write down my dreams, but a dream in order to get in order to get credit for a dream being precognitive in the big book in the sky, I have to first tell my wife that the dream really occurred. So, uh I, I have a bar there. I can't tell her after the fact. Gee, I really had this funny dream. Too bad I didn't tell her. But anyway, so I told her about the strange dream. I wanted to go to Esalen. I couldn't go to Esalen. I was stuck, uh, stuck at the outside. They wouldn't let me in. All my friends were there, and I couldn't go. So that, that was the story. Eight o'clock in the morning. I got a cup of coffee, went to my computer where I'm sitting now, and I had a, a letter, email letter from Jeffrey Kripal at Rice University, whom you know, interested in the spiritual things. And it turns out that he was making a film about Esalen. And he started making that film a decade ago. And I vaguely knew about that. And he sent me the first release of that film. So when I saw a letter from Jeffrey Kripal, I opened it. And it opened up with a picture of all my friends sitting in a circle, including me at Esalen. So within 10 minutes of telling my wife I was left out of the circle of Esalen, there I was on the screen in front of me sitting with all my friends at Esalen. And I thought that was an amazing coincidence because Esalen hadn't been in my thoughts for more than a decade. And there we were. So I would say, as a physicist, that the dream at six o'clock in the morning was caused by my experience of seeing the image two hours later. This is what in physics they call the retrocausality, which is very interesting in high energy physics, where you <clears throat> retrocausality is becoming more and more of a subject of interest. And this looked like the experience I had seeing the circle of friends uh, stimulated the dream two hours earlier. Well, if the future already exists, as these experiences suggest, uh, that would imply to many people that we don't really have free will, which you sort of intimated when you said you don't know how it is that you seem to be so successful at SRI. Maybe it uh, uh, the, our sense of free will is an illusion. Do you have a sense of that yourself, Russell? I think you have free will, but not as much as you think. I think we base. I believe in physics, and I believe in causality. I think that the little wagon that you push begins to move after you push it, not before you push it. But I think that force. I believe Einstein. Um, Newton's law of F, M, F equal M A is correct, that events have causes. However, we don't always know what those causes are. So I think that um, by and large, we live in a causal world. The physicists can't give up causality. But even as um, Pauli said, causality is statistical. It's not... I mean, that's quite a breakthrough for uh, Wolfgang Pauli uh, to begin to talk about statistical causality. 
because his whole life was about causality, but he had precognitive dreams and he knew that he could screw up experiments from a distance. So he, he was aware that causality, although it exists, is not hard and fast. And I agree with that. Uh, to jump around a little bit, another topic that I find of interest is a study that you engaged in. Uh, I was involved in it peripherally, I think back in the 1990s. Uh, you were working with uh, our mutual friend, Dean Brown, and his wife, Wendy. And uh, at that time, your remote viewing partner was Jane Catra. And the study ended up being published in the Journal of Scientific Exploration. You were a remote viewing percipient for a number of trials in that study. That is true. You've unmasked me. Uh, Jane and I were the viewers. Dean and Wendy, her mathematicians, were the judges. So this is a somewhat complicated experiment because it was redundancy coding. That is, Wendy would choose uh, two targets for Jane. Dean would choose two targets for me, and these corresponded to silver going up or down. So I not only had to describe the target that Dean had, but I had to describe the one that corresponded to silver going in the direction it was actually going, and we couldn't know that. But our hypothesis was that if I described the crystal cake dish, which meant silver is going up, and Jane described the uh, coffee grinder, which meant that silver is going up, we could bet on going on silver going up. So what you needed in order to bet in the market, theoretically, is excellent viewings of something, and we had to agree that the something would both be in the same direction, either up or down. So it was redundancy coding. And we did uh, a dozen of those each, and you were allowed to pass. That is to say, if you didn't think it was any good, you could pass. Or if you're judge, if I would describe something and Dean would say, that doesn't correspond to either of my targets, we would pass. So of the things that were judged, we had 11 out of 12 that were correct. There's a highly significant odds of almost one in a thousand. And of the things that would have been traded, we had six out of seven uh, correct. That in the things that were made paper trades, six out of seven of our viewings were correct <clears throat> for the uh, direction of silver moving. So that shows that even inexperienced people with a good protocol and a good supportive environment um, can do this kind of thing. And as you know, years earlier, I had done a similar experiment with Keith Harari, who was an experienced psychic, and we made nine forecasts for silver in the real market, and all nine of our forecasts were correct. We made $120,000 and were displayed on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So that got a lot of attention. We were not successful the following year. We disappointed a lot of people, but we have explanations for that. The simple explanation is that our investor wanted to do two trials a week because we were making so much money. And if you do two trials a week, it means that the viewer does not get feedback for the first trial until after he'd done the second trial. We think that's very bad because he needs feedback in order to be successful. And we published that in the journal of the JSA Journal of Scientific Exploration. Well, would you say, Russell, that your experience in, in that experiment done in the 1990s was any different than the experience you had in 1974 at, at SRI, the day that Pat Price didn't show up? No, I would say, I would say it's very similar. That is, uh, Dean would say, I've got something interesting for you. I'm going to 
tell me about the object I'm going to show you later on. And I would just close my eyes. And in some of those instances, I gave very sharp, correct descriptions. And I described this, the, I still remember this uh, cut glass cake dish that was circular on the bottom and rectangular and square on the top. Very unusual, um, large cake dish of a unusual shape that I described correctly. And another thing he had was a uh, child's rattle, which was shaped like a bone with a, a bell on each end. And I described this plastic thing with, uh, I may have even said it, the, with a, something shaky on each end. So a number, number of those times I had uh, very sharp descriptions. And you use basically the same simple method, just close your eyes and report the imagery that comes up. Well, you're looking for a surprising image. That is my, the, the shibboleth that I created. Is you close your eyes and look for something surprising that comes, comes to your attention. And that, that seems to be very helpful. You do not have to eat porridge at the feet of your guru. You do not have to pay a teacher thousands of dollars. Remote viewing is very, very easy to do. And I'm, I'm writing a new book that I told you about, Mind Beyond Space and Time, Learning and Remote Viewing from the Masters. Uh, I'm not the master. We've got Hella Hammond, Ingo Swan, Pat Price, Joe McMonagall describing what their process is. And mm, halfway through this book, I hope to, hope to have it published this year sometime. Well, it's wonderful that you're still active and talking about remote viewing, Russell, after all these years. I know you have many, many more stories uh, to tell. We haven't gotten to them all, so I hope we can schedule yet another interview uh, in the future. But for the time being, I want to thank you once again so much for being with me and with the New Thinking Aloud audience. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's always a great pleasure to be here with you and uh, talk about my favorite subject. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.